Uh, we are about to start, so uh, you guys may sit a little bit for uh, like come come to uh, your seats, and we will start in shot. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Heyman Wong, and uh, welcome to the Answer College. So uh, I, I'm going to be the MC of today's uh, seminar. So uh, let me introduce myself for a little bit. I'm a student at the Anson College right now, and I'm, I'm a sophomore. Uh, I'm majoring in political science and history. So um, a little bit, uh, who, who is the first time that you are in the Anson College? Please raise your hand. Yes, yeah, so for many of you guys, uh, this is the first time that you guys are in the Anza, so uh, you might or may not have heard of the Anza. So we're a junior college, and uh, most of uh, the students come to our um, college and, uh, to attend for a two years program. And after they're finishing their two years program, then they're uh, transferring to other universities. Even though we're not as prestige as other universities like UC Berkeley or Stanford, but a lot of our alumni goes to like attend those um, different colleges after they graduate from the Anza College. And um, the size of the academics to see, uh, we're also famous for uh, our student activism work. So uh, in terms of sp um, political engagement, today we're honorable enough to have like the two different speakers coming all the way from Hong Kong, and then the Legislators Council member. So the first one is uh, Mr. Alvin Young. And the uh, second one is uh, Mr. Charles Mock. So Mr. Elton Young, uh, he's a barrister in Hong, um, in Hong Kong. He's also a legislative member uh, representing the East, uh, East New Territories, which is my constituent, uh, as my, my, my constituent. And um, he obtained a uh, undergraduate degree in uh, University of uh, Western uh, Ontario for political science. And after that, he obtained a law degree in University of uh, uh, Peking University in 2003. And for Charles Mock, uh, he's representing the IT technology information uh, uh, functioning um, functioning council member in in, uh, in Hong Kong uh, Legislative uh, Council. And um, he obtained his uh, degree in electrical engineering and and then he uh, he's a PhD candidate right now at Shang No, 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 that's okay. very old. <laughs> a very, very old uh, uh, bio, but a, a master in Purdue yeah. University. Yeah. So uh, we are honorable uh, today to have them to share their opinion on their visit to Silicon Valley and how they can see Hong Kong as a technology hub to enhance Hong Kong's uh, technology development. So right now uh, we, uh, I introduce um, uh, Joseph Ng from International Student Programs uh, on behalf of the ANSA and he's going to give a souvenir to our two honorable guests. Hello everybody, my name is Joseph Ng. I'm the uh, program supervisor of the International Student Program at the Anza College. Uh, even though this, this seminar is not sponsored by our office, but I'm extremely proud of Heyman and uh, all the volunteers, since Heyman is a foreign student in the, uh, uh, the Anza College in my program. So I want to give a big thank you to Heyman for coordinating this program. And, and of course, I want to uh, something for you. Any any guest for us is, is our guest. So uh, something just like Dr. Chen the other night at Stanford. I have included the map in the back also. Um, so I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Don't thank want you. to waste more time. Thank you. Seminars. One is held at the University of Stanford on Wednesday. Um, so we are honorable to cooperate with the um, Department of East Asian Study in Stanford University, uh, according to Professor Ming Chen, help. And uh, for um, Stanford Hong Kong Student Association with President Ho Chin Yu. And I will also like to thank uh, North, the Northern California Association for Hong Kong Club and Mr. Ken Chen. So let's start our seminar today. So um, this is your first visit uh, this during this trip. It's like about a, a week. Like um, so, where have you guys been? Like uh, where? Which companies have you guys visited? Or like, what is the experience that you guys gained from it? Would you mind sharing with our audience? Uh, perhaps uh, I, I could start first. It's really my first trip here. But before that, uh, thank you, thank you, Heyman. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor, of course, and thank you, Chan, uh, uh, Ken, Chan. and uh, for hosting us here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at uh, the answer. 
Um, this is my really first time here at Silicon Valley. I like Charles. Uh, he has been here forever. Uh, he actually he came from uh, Silicon Valley. Well, well. And Charles is a tech guy. I'm a layman. I'm the, the end user perspective. Uh, the purpose of our trip here is to, of course, to visit a number of giant tech companies to understand what's really going on in this in the capital of the tech world. That's number one. And number two is to understand um, why and or for whatever reason, if they have any interest to invest in Hong Kong. Uh, if not, why not? Uh, that is the most important question that we have to ask. Uh, other than that, we have paid visits to a number of cities, uh, especially to pay visits to their uh, officials handling smart city. Uh, as you may know, the Hong Kong government has published a blueprint uh, two years ago to with a hope to establish a smart city but until now it's still a bit of talking but here a lot of cities uh, they have already implemented their policy so we have to find out what's really going on and the challenges they have encountered over the past two years uh, that's the other side of the story so uh, we to me is fascinating fascinating in the sense that uh, it feels like this land here of technology. Uh, different companies, of course, they have different edges, they have different new stuff to show us. But on top of that, we also learn from all these companies and representatives uh, how they position Hong Kong, or how Hong Kong is like in their radar. And to tell you, in short, we are not on their radar. To a number of companies, to a number of VCs, they would say they would not consider Hong Kong. Why? Because it's just simply Hong Kong is not on the list. We are not competitive, competitive enough in terms of tech, in terms of technology. So uh, it, strike me, it strikes me that there are lots of things that we have to do when we return back home. Uh, we have to give advice uh, to, the, to the government, especially when the government have this feel-good uh, uh, feeling that we are, we are, of course, we are at the top of uh, finance, we are at the top of professional services uh, compared to our competitors. But when it comes to InnoTech, we are still far behind. So there are lots of things that we have to do. And I think that's a good timing to pass it on to our IT rep who knows a lot of things. Okay, just very briefly to add to, uh, to Elvin. Uh, yes, I, I, uh, I lived in the Silicon Valley in the Bay Area between 1990 to 1994 which is uh, before half of you were born in this room. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, so I, I, I came from the technology sector. I, and so, uh, you know, and, and also, of course, because I do represent the IT sector in, in, in Hong Kong. So, in fact, meeting and talking with many of these companies, including many of those who were, that we met on this trip, uh, actually, uh, are companies that we have been working with for a long time, including even in Hong Kong. And some of those companies, uh, we meet with them because uh, they run into a lot of regulatory issues in Hong Kong. Uh, it wouldn't surprise you, those would be the kind of companies like Uber or Airbnb, Airbnb and so on. Now, there are also other types of companies that are seeking to probably uh, expand the use or the research or the kind of technology that they have developed in here to other markets, including Hong Kong and other parts of Asia. And then they would be probably having to consider whether they would choose Singapore or Taiwan or China or Hong Kong or Japan or whatever to, uh, to expand their business. Now, again, like uh, Elvin said, uh, we're, we're, we had the feeling that we were not quite on their radar. And uh, surely, when we talk to some of them here, we are finding similar sentiments. Uh, we can further get into why there is such kind of sentiment that they have told us. But uh, uh, our work is, I, I, at least for me, uh, uh, it is, I do believe that it is very important to get these international companies to be in Hong Kong for uh, and expand their presence, not just a sales office. Uh, surely, you know, they sell a lot of Facebook or Google apps in, uh, ads in Hong Kong, but that's not enough. Uh, we, why? Because I think it is important to, for us in Hong Kong to get uh, the commitment of some of these leading companies, not just in China, but actually from all over the world, in order to create good jobs for our young people who are graduating in technology. 
You know why people in Hong Kong, young grad, young young students in Hong Kong, were not choosing to go into technology, even though many of them are very interested in those subjects. It's because they do not find that they could get a good uh, a career in Hong Kong. Uh, all the government is telling them to do is startup, but of course, you know, it's not just a hundred percent of startup. That doesn't happen. Not even in in Silicon Valley. So uh, we do need those companies to be in Hong Kong, number one, to uh, create good jobs and create more opportunities and maintain Hong Kong as an international city, not just in financial services, but also in other areas that are emerging. And actually, I wouldn't even say that technology is emerging. It is already here. You know, all the most uh, important or, or highest valued companies in the world uh, today, globally, are all technology companies, so we shouldn't be out of this, uh, this whole scene. So for all these reasons, and also one very important reason that I think Alvin alluded to, when the, the, our government and the mainland government were talking about all these development with the Greater Bay Area, Taiwan Koi, when they were talking about this vision, uh, they always compare themselves with uh, this Bay Area. Now, uh, uh, now uh, 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 that's also part of the reason why we want to be here is that, okay, you know, uh, uh, it, it, the comparison doesn't make sense. You know, they always say that this particular Bay Area here is, you know, 10 times smaller or high, how, however many times smaller in size, in population, and in terms of GDP compared to the Guangdong, Hong Kong, uh, and Macau, uh, uh, Bay Area, so we have a great potential with that Bay, Greater Bay Area. It's greater than this, right? Obviously, because the name is Greater Bay Area. This is just a Bay Area, right? So, uh, you know, they officials, but probably this is the Chinese way, mainland way. They like to, uh, they like to, uh, they like to do these sort of things. But you know, and when we are here, you know, uh, actually, I know, and uh, and it's also very important that more legislators, Alvin and others would also see for themselves what are the differences here. You know, other than all the kinds of freedoms and uh, the, the and so on. You know, a very important thing is you are not talking about the local market, you are talking about the world. And I think if for Hong Kong or even for, for China, the most important thing that we are going to, the role of Hong Kong is going to be, is going to be maintaining ourselves as an international city. And this is not just going to be for financial services. It must be also for technology as well. And in fact, uh, you know, I could go on and on, but uh, I, I think those are some of the reasons why we have chosen to come back here, to come, for me to come back here, because I come back here all the time. I, my, my wife's family, you know, they're here. I have to, I have to, I have to do my duties, okay? But uh, so, so I, I come back here and meet with and talk to those companies all the time. It's not the first time that I do it, but uh, I think it's a great uh, chance for other legislators particularly on our camp, uh, you know, uh, to come and, uh, and see for themselves. And back in Hong Kong, I think we can present a much more balanced view to the government when they are talking about developing of innovation and technology policies, development of the Greater Bay Area, and so on. Okay, so moving back from Silicon Valley back to Hong Kong. So um, how would you to assess Hong Kong's current um, IT industrial development? Uh, what is the stage of Hong Kong's IT? development because like comparing Hong Kong to a lot of like different um, neighborhood cities such as Singapore yeah. right, or like other countries such as India they have a like, really advanced yeah. technology yeah. and yeah. Hong Kong to some extent is like um, a little bit behind so what is the cause of it and how would you assess like which states of Hong Kong is currently in right now okay I'll, I'll try first okay um, yeah we're always saying that we, I think in the last recent years because Hong Kong uh, uh, government has been talking more and more about developing of this so-called innovation and technology uh, technology uh, industry that uh, that uh, people are saying that we're behind uh, and I think people sometimes and I think it's a yes and no you know we're behind but a lot of times I think people perceive us to be behind for the wrong reasons they are always comparing ourselves with China and they're always comparing ourselves with WeChat Pay or Alipay and so on and uh, these sort of cashless tools and so on. Those are not rocket science. 
they, are, they were successful in China because the Chinese banking system is so backward and inefficient that even the government decided that they need these tools that, uh, that will benefit their rural population, make it easy and so on, and ignore all the privacy and security issues and uh, get the convenience, and the Chinese population loved it. But that is not something that we should copy. Uh, I think our biggest worry right now, if I go back to some of the points that I was saying about creating opportunity for our next generation or even to, for this generation of technology people, making sure that Hong Kong continue to be on the technology roadmap, in fact, uh, of the technology map. Uh, in fact, you know, if we look back 34 years ago, Hong Kong wasn't behind when we adopted the first and earliest big mainframe computers uh, to be adopted in public services and commercial services and banking services, we were way ahead of other, other countries. Even the Japanese uh, stock exchange had to buy solutions from Hong Kong companies. What changed? Uh, we focused totally afterwards in the last 30 years into financial services and property. So again, more and more people in Hong Kong talk about diversification, which I think is, of course, we need to do that. But I think we have to also realize that our competitors or our role model need not and should not be China or only China. We should be looking at, uh, okay, why is Singapore right now perceived to be a, uh, a more uh, uh, active or doing better than Hong Kong? You know, their government is much more flexible than ours. When Uber went to Singapore, uh, the government sat down with them and said, oh, we welcome you, come to, Hong Kong, uh, come to Singapore. And uh, there are, I, uh, we noticed that there are three or four areas of the law that we need to change. So let's change it. The taxi driver opposed, well, forget them. We need to advance, we need to change, we need to, we need to do something new. But for Hong Kong, what happened? Our Invest Hong Kong inv uh, invited uh, Uber to came, come to Hong Kong, and uh, and then the taxi drivers industry protested, and then the police went about uh, arresting uh, drivers uh, of Uber, and then Invest Hong Kong took down the the web page uh, promotion for Uber and said we have nothing to do with them. So that become a that became an international not a scandal but an international laughing sure. stock, yeah. right? So. Uh, that's the kind of thing, that's the bureaucracy that we face in Hong Kong. That's why we're behind many of these initiatives that the government are implementing today, including the, that uh, matching fund for VC. We told them to do this 10 years ago, but they only do it now. Because you, you were not alleged. Yeah, well, well, no, well, you weren't either. <laughs> okay. I wasn't because of him. <laughs> but anyway, um, Bureaucracy, I would say bureaucracy, outdated laws, those are the most important thing. Not because we lack money, uh, all the money that actually, went some many, a lot of those money that went to investing into technology companies in China, in Singapore, actually started from IFC in Central. The offices are there, are there, but they just don't invest in Hong Kong because the risk and the, and the payback is not there. Why? Because uh, I been saying, and I'll stop with this comment, uh, there are three things that we are lacking in. Capital, I sort of mentioned it, uh, because our government and, uh, haven't really created a market, so investors think that there's no money, no payback, they don't come. But it's not because of lack of capital, the lack of capital. Second, people. This is a big problem. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, when I went to school, uh, when I picked what major to go into in Hong Kong, the top student getting A's and you know the top students in the Hong Kong third exam, they all went into uh, engineering, science, medicine, and so on. Today, they, they don't go into business, okay? Business is something that you learned and you can do anyway. But now today, they all went to the international global business, whatever, finance, and so on. And law. And law. Well, they, they, they went into law too, uh, and the only consideration is your English needs to be quite good. Uh, but anyway, at that time, okay. But anyway, law, okay, law, law, law. And medicine, those, law and medicine, those, they are always there. But you don't, you don't have, you, your number of students is relatively small. The big impact is really business. So anyway, that, so, 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 so we have a, and, and, and so we have a lack of quantity as well as quality of good uh, talent in Hong Kong for technology. And finally, market. 
the government hasn't really done what other governments, like you mentioned, Singapore and Taiwan and so on, in creating the market. What does that mean? Government has to start using the technology that they said they encourage these startups to do, and not when it comes to adopting the technologies. They go back to IBM and say that's safe because I can't tell somebody that I use a, a, a startup's product because it's because they, you have no reference. So uh, safe thing. IBM, IBM, IBM. I'm just sorry. IBM is usually what we use as an example. It's not just one company, but they use the big names. Okay, so uh, that's the problem. So uh, I think it's only recently that we have talked about these for a long time. Government begins to realize that maybe they have to do something. And I hope, well, I hope, I hope when we go back and we uh, summarize everything that we have found on this trip, we'll make our recommendation, our summary report to the government and to the public, and we hope that you know, it will facilitate some change in, in, that, in the right direction. Uh, I, I'm not a tech guy, as I mentioned right at the beginning. So from my point of view is, I'm slightly more distant from what Charles can see. He's more in the industry, he can see from the, from the industry. Don't go to him, I know. No. Um, to me, I go back to the basics, is the people. At the end of the day, tag, we do tag not for the sake of doing tag. Yeah. Uh, this is the line, the quote I picked up from almost all every official government. We, we yeah. met here from the government level, from the city level. Uh, doing tag is not for the purpose of showing off that we have the ability to do tag. It's for the people. We are here to solve problems. Uh, my concern is in the case of Hong Kong, it always appears to me that the government is eager to show off for a simple reason. Uh, they have to, you know, to polish their CV. So there are reasons that they have to put up something, a lot of programs, lot of, uh, and you know, is there's a big happy problem for Hong Kong that we never lack of revenue. We have a huge reserve. So unlike the counterparts we have encountered here, mm -hmm. uh, on the city level, every government official, they would think of a way to, to gain money, to, 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 uh, increase the to increase the revenue. So TAC is there to help them to increase the revenue. Whereas in Hong Kong, there's no such urge, uh, eager need. So that's a background problem, of course. And on top of that, um, you may say I'm, I'm rather ignorant, which I confess. But after visiting all these major companies, uh, especially Facebook, of course, it feels like going to Disneyland, of course, on one hand. But on the other hand, you can see how companies treat their employees, how they treasure these talents. When we are still having this debate, whether we should have a, implement a standard working uh, hours in Hong Kong, whether we should have uh, leaves, for the, for the new fathers and mothers in Hong Kong. Facebook has already granted four months, four months. to both parents. <laughs> when we have uh, Tommy Zhang, Zhang Yuyang, making all the silly comments a week ago, we are seeing all these companies treating all their talents, their employees, as their biggest treasures. This is a mentality difference. This is a cultural difference. But I do not see why we cannot adopt it. Um, so is the, Charles has mentioned about the government side. I saw the uh, commercial yeah. uh, uh, point uh, perspective. And one more very important uh, uh, difference I, we, can, uh, we can feel from that of Hong Kong and our competitors, name uh, most uh, significant is uh, Singapore. When, whenever we encounter our friends here, uh, business, government, we ask them, have you greeted or met any representatives from the Hong Kong government? No. We met a lot of Singaporean government visits, of Taiwanese and of course mainland China, but Hong Kong, not that I can think of. So it shows how eager our competitors in the region are doing. They wish to learn from Silicon Valley. They wish to find out the solution and how to improve. So. This is more striking. Um, so when we have back, um, not that one summary or report can change everything, but that 
sort of impact will definitely bring it to the attention of those in power if they are willing to listen. Um, you guys have covered a little bit of my question, but I'm still gonna like ask. Um, can you make it clear? Because like you guys are legislative council members, and um, for tech, for most of the people like uh, the modern people like living in Hong Kong, living in Silicon Valley, they treat politics and technology separately. So, what would you suggest? What is the, um, the correlation between between the technology development and the um, political institution, or like when you're forming policies? What about, what is the correlation in between two? The simple answer is who decided policies? You know, it's human beings. And of course, it's the government. It's the leg well, the executive branch, to be specific, in the case of Hong Kong. And the legislature plays a role. We are there to scrutinize and get things, you know, to push things forward. So at the end of the day, is the government officials' mentality that has to do with technology development. Um, when Singapore is sending all their officials to here, when Singapore is having all these programs allowing youngsters, especially in the startup industry, uh, to come and learn from their counterparts here with a fellowship program, we are basically doing nothing other than asking our young talents to return to the Greater Bay Area for a better future. Uh, this is politics. Uh, so that's my simple answer. I, I, I'm not sure why that uh, impression would come up, uh, maybe with Hong Kong, maybe especially with some of the Hong Kong people. But uh, how could politics and economics or economic activities be separated? I mean, every day you read the news in here with uh, you know Donald Trump's uh, this action or that action and so on. It all has to do with economics. It all has to do with uh, the well-being of you know creating jobs or. Uh, and uh, uh, bringing economic well-being, increasing uh, income for people and so on. And funny thing, I mean, this is partly, I really think it has to do with politics. You know, we don't have democracy, we don't have universal suffrage in Hong Kong, right? And uh, when I lived in the U.S., I lived in the U.S. for 13 years, I watched other people vote for presidents and Congress and so on, every other year or, or and so on, every cycle. And then I hear all these campaign speeches, they all talk about creating jobs, I'm going to create 10,000 jobs for Wisconsin, I'm going to bring this company here and there. You know, you never hear people talking about that when they campaign in Hong Kong. Why? It is because we don't, you don't get to vote. The average people don't get to vote. So uh, if there are particular uh, among the 777 voters for Carrie Lam, you know, uh, what they really need to get from Carrie Lam, do they need to watch TV and find out what Carrie Lam is going to do for them? They don't need to. They, they talk to her like this, right? And they, they talk in private, right? That's our problem. So in fact, this economic well-being, including inc in, in, improving the loss of the common people should be a political issue. But a lot of times, other than welfare issues in Hong Kong, nobody talk about creating more jobs for, for uh, people in Hong Kong. You know, uh, they might talk about, uh, uh, we need to create more uh, uh, transportation uh, uh, for tra uh, industry. We need to do more this and that. But actually, they're talking to the bosses. So that's the difference. So it really has to do with, 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 with politics, I think, actually. But it's unfortunate that a lot of these issues uh, that should be dealt with politically, should be dealt with, with, with even to the extent of an uh, electoral system, uh, somehow, actually, in Hong Kong, they are shoved aside. And then, unfortunately, and then people say, we, the Democrats, Democrats are just populist, and we're just you know talking about welfare all the time. You know, actually, all these issues are should be talked about, and in fact, in a political sense. And there's nothing wrong with political, uh, in, you know, they always say you politicizing this, politicizing that. I think that is wrong. That's just an excuse for uh, some existed, existed, existing vested interest to uh, hold on to their, their own uh, small interest. So I think, uh, in fact, uh, yeah, politics and, eco and the economy and economic matters uh, always goes together, which should go together. Mm. Okay, so after listening to your experience for, from a trip in the Bay Area and like uh, what we're assessing, why is Hong Kong uh, a little bit like 
develop the IT later than like compared to other countries. So what do you guys think Hong Kong's, Hong Kong's role should be in Silicon Valley? And how do like we, like most of us who live in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley can do and can take advantage of it? Like what do you guys think of that? Uh, uh, first of all, actually Hong Kong didn't uh, get into the technology sector after others. It's only that we started early, but we fallen behind. Now, having said that, I think uh, Hong Kong's role is still going to be an important uh, uh, based on the fact that we are a strong financial services center. Uh, it is in fact very natural that a lot of these uh, technology development, particularly, you know, a lot of times when we look at even Silicon Valley or US or international companies, you know, they cannot ignore the Chinese market. Uh, you know, people were talking about like Google trying to cave into the Chinese government uh, uh, demands for creating, for creating an app with censorship, search app with censorship. Of course, we are all against it. But then again, if you look at it from the Google's point, uh, or the CEO, not the employees, from the CEO of Google's point of view, you sort of understand where he is coming from, even though I think most of us, many of us in this room may not agree with that. But his reason is because he needs to find new areas of growth. For a lot of companies, you just cannot tell the CEO you ignore a market like China. But I'm always saying to, 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 uh, to a lot of people that even in the, in the current situation with the trade war uh, and pending or, in, or, or continuing trade war between the US and China, in fact, we should tell more um, uh, of these international companies to come to Hong Kong. Why? Because uh, they just want to, you know, they, all they are looking for primarily and ultimately should be, you know, business and revenues and so on. Now, increasingly, it is clearer and clearer to them, including many of them that we met on this trip, about the risk in China. Policy risk, political risk, including because of American actions and those without American action, also very risky in China, including intellectual property problems and so on. Now, Hong Kong is always the safe harbor for uh, companies that want to explore getting into the China market. And at the same time, you know, even for communications, for telecom and so on, we've always, Hong Kong is always the hub anyway. So, uh, and that's why actually, I mean, even for companies such as Uber, Airbnb and so on, type of company or other kinds of companies, doesn't have to be them. Many of them do want to come to Hong Kong. But the problem is, I go back to some of the bureaucracy and, uh, and government ineptitude or incompetence that are holding them back. So in fact, uh, many of them do want to come to Hong Kong, but uh, and, and not, not just, but of course, uh, with a lot of consideration, but not just with the consideration of China market. So uh, in fact, uh, what we're doing right now uh, in Hong Kong with our government is actually in many cases uh, slowing them down. So uh, I think, uh, you know, I, I do believe that we've always, we have always been on the radar, especially on the large companies. Hong Kong is a mark. Hong Kong is actually a very large market in terms of uh, our GDP and our population and so on. It's big, obviously big, still bigger than Singapore. Uh, it probably will continue to be bigger than Singapore, at least in terms of population. So uh, it, it is never, it has never been a market that many of these larger companies can ignore. But of course, we need to also do better on the size, on, on, the, on the area with the, uh, with the investors and these startup companies that I mentioned. Uh, uh, but for the big companies, I think many of them do want to come to Hong Kong. They're just finding the environment uh, you know, unfavorable or too slow or government support too lacking. Uh, that's why they have been delayed. Um, what can you do to contribute to Hong Kong? Well, a number of you decided to move to Silicon Valley or the Bay Area, and you're not returning. A lot of you established some of your career, part of your career in Hong Kong, but you decided to come here. We have met a number of young entrepreneurs 
they have great ideas. Um, they uh, earned their first uh, bucket of capitals in Hong Kong, but they thought, and they found out that there was a bottleneck. So they thought it's better to move, uh, to return to Silicon Valley. So there are better opportunities here. There are better talents here for them to hire. So it's not a question of why or how you can contribute. It's how Hong Kong can keep you and without you looking outward. Um, before my trip here, I just farewell a young couple. Um, he's uh, an engineer uh, in Google, uh, Apple, and he returned to Canada for good with his young family. Uh, so it's not only about working opportunities, because as, a, as an Apple engineer, you have no problem working anywhere. But he decided to sell his flat, uh, to unroot himself, and return to Canada for good. Why? So it's more, it goes beyond than simple uh, technology or innovation policy. It's the bigger environment, it's politics, it's education, it's the future. So I can't blame anyone who decided to stay in here or Canada or anywhere without returning, without looking back. It's, it makes perfect sense. Uh, in fact, it's more like our job and more than ours is the, the, the Kerry Lamb's job to bring you home. <laughs> and it, I know, I understand. But it's, it's more like her job to do anything to demonstrate that you deserve to say. Uh, but of course, there are more than a simple line or two uh, to talk about this matter. Uh, there are political issues. But living politics aside, is Hong Kong really bad? Um, in the eyes of the investors, Hong Kong is still a good choice, uh, still on, at the top of our list, uh, of their list. Uh, compared to Taiwan, we have a better legal system. Uh, and also compared to the mainland China, of course, we have better IP protection. Uh, I have no idea what kind of edges we have compared to Singapore other than the proximity to mainland China, which uh, we have to accept is um, one of our uh, stronger point uh, compared to Singapore. We have a stronger and bigger market uh, at the back, that is China. And Singaporeans also, also say that they envy us of having China at the back, but of course they don't get to understand the kind of problems and suffer we that we get uh, having China next to us. But that's another matter. That's more more like a political issue, and of course from the Singaporeans' point of view, politics should not be a problem. No, they they are their own dictators or authoritarian government, so they don't they don't need China. They already have. It. <laughs> um, so it's it's not an easy question to answer. Hey? what you can contribute. You know, you have your uh, free will. You can decide. A lot of your students here, a lot of you may choose to stay here uh, in the Bay Area or in America or North America in general. It's, it's fine. And some of you do uh, tech uh, or science. Of course, you have a better future here. Uh, but if you do political science, there's no future <laughs> in Hong Kong. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, I, I thought it was a very interesting case to look at. Yeah, so <laughs> science, yes, and political science is better in Hong Kong. <laughs> so um, speaking as a student, like I've studied in Hong Kong and I've studied in the United States. Um, so just like you guys mentioned, when, uh, when students are picking their subjects like in Hong Kong, um, they are either going, picking for law, for the professions, for law, for medicine, um, for um, ENF, ANF, finance, BBA, all those um, professional subjects. So. And IT in Hong Kong is often viewed as like um, a really working class, and there's a term in Hong Kong in our generation called IT Gao. So the ones who laugh would like understand. So it's describing the um, extreme hardship of like Hong Kong young adult when they're trying to enter the IT industry. So besides the political factor, like what do you think like? What are the factors that um, encourage this phenomenon, or like to let the society have this perception? Like, what causes this, and how can we fix this? It's, it's not an easy fix. Um, it takes generations and generations 
to adopt that perception that becoming a white collar with your nice suit and tie, walking around in central means a lot. Um, and you can't blame the youngsters because uh, your income means a lot to them. And working in, say, typo, uh, science park is not as sexy and attractive uh, as to their counterparts in central. It, it's just normal. But things are changing. I can see that things are changing in the sense that um, I'm not sure whether I have shared this uh, when I was in Stanford the other day. Um, I read on the Financial Times uh, before my, my trip here, uh, even the hedge funds, they are having problem recruiting young talents. So you can imagine the hedge funds, of course, whenever you meet your hedge fund, not your, but those hedge fund managers, they are of course in the best suits and ties and uptight. Uh, but ch things are changing because they know they have to recruit, they are competing with Facebook and Google and so, uh, so on in Silicon Valley. So those in, on the Wall Street, they have to scale down. They are, they are not expecting their employees to be in uh, suits and ties. They are having, they're redecorating their offices to have those nice uh, snack bars uh, so that youngsters would rather to would choose uh, Wall Street over Silicon Valley. Uh, that's the trend. And I'm pretty sure that trend will be adopted in Hong Kong somehow. Uh, it's just that we, it, it, it would take a bit of time. Uh, I can also share this uh, uh, with you. Is last year this time, uh, Charles and I were in Israel. Uh, we were on a trip, a uh, Lechko official trip to Israel to, to have a better understanding of the startup nation. Um, so, of course, uh, we all know Israel equals startup nation. But why? Um, interestingly, we spoke to a number of uh, Jewish people, and uh, those in Israel, they said in the old days, we Jewish family, we encourage uh, our kids to do uh, medicine and law and those money-making professions. That was the trend. Now, we encourage them to do computer science. We encourage them to uh, start to have startup. That's the trend. So it takes quite a bit of time for you know, for a culture to uh, to adopt the new kind of uh, ways. Um, I'm not sure how long that would take in Hong Kong, uh, but if people start seeing a future, start seeing hope, then of course I'm sure the best students will choose uh, computer science and engineering over law and medicine. I, I, I tell you what, I, I think it, can, it doesn't take a long time. It can change very quickly. It, uh, sometimes people think that it's a cultural issue. 30 years ago or more, people would go into, science students would go into engineering because, they, uh, because at that time, in that economy, they would perceive and they, the young people or even their families would value a stable career uh, in being a professional, whether you be a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer, engineer, is a profession no? um, in those days. And really, at those days, they can get into governments, they can get into private companies with, which hire engineers and get, get a good job, stable job. But and, and, and at that time, there are no in, there wasn't a, such a vibrant investment bank uh, uh, phenomena. If they go into banking, they will start from being a teller or an accountant, and that is not attractive compared to being an engineer. So that was the world 30 or 40 years ago. It has changed because of this speculative investment banking culture. But if you go to Stanford University, Berkeley, and so on, uh, my understanding is the queue, the line for top students to get into computer science is probably longer than getting into uh, uh, other disciplines, including even business, for undergraduates, okay? And why? Because students know when they get out, they get, if they are uh, so tops and uh, able to get into Facebook, they get paid what? Uh, yeah, 200. Uh, 200, 200 more, uh, 200,000 or That's more. 
we were told that yeah. the uh, uh, anyway they get but two hundred is the average yeah uh, average, average okay maybe but anyway the starting salary okay is crazy but it's good okay so so the it, Americans or or the rest of the world is not more uh, or worse in culture or different from Chinese or Hong Kong people they are all also very practical where the opportunities are where the money is. where the money is. So uh, that's why they flock to investment banking. But now some are coming back after the financial tsunami, right? Even before that, I remember five, six years ago or, or something like that, Obama was putting out YouTube videos telling young students, don't just go into finance because the world needs you to do our and Do you think Kerry should do the same? Well, I, I don't think she can. I don't, the problem is, I don't think she can inspire the young people the way Obama might be able to. Uh, so let's forget it. But, uh, but, the mess, but the message needs to be there. It's not just one or two leaders, presidents or chief executive telling you to do it. We need the market to really function and say that, hey, you know what? Young people come out these days, they can get a great job at Apple in Hong Kong. Uh, actually, those jobs in Apple shop uh, are quite good as well. They pay uh, much higher than average because it's Apple. Uh, really? But but uh, still, I mean, I'm talking about more development and uh, technical jobs. Okay, uh, so uh, if they can get, a, if young people perceive that they can get a great job from these top companies, and not just Alibaba, please, but other top companies, uh, all these from all around the world. And you tell me, okay, can, when can you have a homegrown Hong Kong one? I'm sorry, it might take some time. But uh, that's the way Singapore is doing. You know, I'm saying Singapore, Google, five years ago, if you look at Google Hong Kong, Google Singapore, we're about the same. We, they, they have small office, sales people primarily, uh, 100 or so people. Today, Hong Kong, same, half a floor or whatever in Times Square, not much bigger than before. But Singapore, they're already going on to almost a, a thousand five hundred and almost two two thousand people. Why? Why? Well, you uh, let's ask why. Okay. Uh, recently, in recent years, uh, a couple years, Taiwan is attracting all these companies from Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Apple, uh, Google, Facebook to establish R and D centers in Taiwan. Why not Hong Kong? Well, let's ask that question. You know, that's the kind of thing that can attract more young people to go into technology because they know they can make good money. They know they have more important than immediate quick money or free lunch. More important than that, a good career. So if the perception is that I still need to only go into uh, IFC for banking, uh, finance, uh, iBank in order to have a good career, uh, then they will choose that. So I think, in fact, if we can, if we can create that kind of market and availability of top good jobs, oh, they will change right away. Because many many students actually are interested in this more than just uh, being a financial analyst or an eye banker or whatever. You know, it sounds sexy, but in fact, you know how, you know, anyway. So. Okay. So. Um Last question is going to be, um, so after your visit in the Bay Area, which you guys have been to different tech companies and the above discussions, which we realize where the problem in Hong Kong is. And um, so what is the main thing or main message that you would like to bring back to Hong Kong? And what is the thing that you're going to do after you go back to the Legislative Council? What, what um, are you looking to accomplish uh, after this trip? Well, uh uh, like uh, Elvin started talking about when we came to here, when we came here, uh, we were looking at meeting primarily three types of uh, uh, stakeholders. Some of these companies uh, that are technology companies here that are facing certain problems or we're trying to get them to invest more in Hong Kong. We heard their message. Uh, we are going to be doing different things on different issues from you know transportation issues to uh, uh, share home uh, 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 home sharing issues to uh, uh, these are individual policy issues to uh, issues that has to do with data centers or undersea cables and so on. So we have a whole long list of these issues that some of these companies are facing and telling us that they need Hong Kong companies to update the laws and do better. That's one one side. Uh, 
uh, we heard from a lot of the investors and uh, and startup, especially uh, those that has a Hong Kong root that came to, from Hong Kong. Now uh, they're giving us a lot of good uh, ideas and reasons why they are coming back or going to here, uh, Silicon Valley, to expand their business. And I think the message, strong message that we need to bring back to our government is that we need to get back on the agenda, uh, the, on the radar, on the agenda of people here, governments here, and so on. We need to do, and actually it's not new, I've, I've been saying it for many years, but uh, I hope this time when Elvin helped me pitch the same message, more people will listen. It's like, uh, Hong Kong doesn't have an office in Silicon Valley to promote our industry, including the tech industry. Shenzhen has one. Does it mean that my company has to go to Qinghai to open an office in order to get introduced to Silicon Valley? That's the irony. And we call ourselves an international city. Now, this is the kind of thing and policies that we need to push our government to do. They need to do it on their own and not just, uh, you know, join the big club of the Greater Bay Area and rely on China to help us, okay? This is, we are the international city. We can help them. We should help them when we should, but not, 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 not do it, not, not to do it directly when we are able to. And finally, uh, I think we also pick up a few lessons from how to improve this smart, so-called smart city and the open data type of government policies that are lagging behind. You know, we ask all these government officials here, how do they deal with a siloed government? How do they incentivize different departments to pick up new ideas and uh, internal, internal innovation? Uh, so those are some very practical uh, ideas that we will also bring out and bring back and share with our government. Charles has basically covered sort of issues we wish to uh, bring up. Um, but it's not, it's not only the policy side. It's not, of course, there are issues of deregulations, uh, which matters a lot to the sharing economy businesses. Uh, but how are we going to push the government to adopt a more abrasive and forward-looking kind of attitude? I think that matters more. And our summary or our reports will not be the last uh, push. I would say that's the beginning of it. And we'll have to share that with our colleagues, uh, with those who are willing to listen from the executive branch, but also to the people of Hong Kong. Um, a number of Hong Kong people might not be aware of the situation. And that is also equally important. Um, we'll be doing a lot of debriefings uh, via the media or we'll speak uh, to the people directly uh, via our social media platform. Um, I would say in technology, one year or two is the, means a decade. So time is not on our side, especially when our competitors are so aggressive and passionate uh, about attracting all these capitals and, uh, and talents. Um, there are things that are easier to, to, to be done than the other. Um, the deregulation might take a bit longer, but having the governments to change their attitude, uh, I would say is more like a top-down thing. And if Kerry Lam is serious about uh, making Hong Kong the next innovation hub of the region, then I'm sure she will be able to make some changes. Uh, that is a pitch. Uh, we hope uh, the government will be able to listen. I, I just want to add a couple of points after hearing what Elvin said. Uh, time is not on our side, yes and no, because we are behind, but in technology, as those of us, I think especially if those of us in technology knows, you can always leapfrog and jump right ahead to the front. That is a bit different from some of the other traditional industries. And uh, you see an example even among some of these countries, you look at Korea, how they were, you know, devastated as a country after the financial uh, Crisis. disaster crisis uh, 2000, and then they jump right back to the uh, top to, to the top of the game to the head of the uh, to the to the leadership uh, uh, position. Uh, in a sense, in a way, even China could do it. So I don't think it is it, it, theoretically it's not impossible. Okay, 
But uh, also a very important thing that we pick up on this trip is uh, I know that when we talk about technology, innovation technology, support for innovation technology, we face a lot of challenges within the Hong Kong community when we talk about this. People would say, oh, the government put uh, 50 billion, 50 billion dollars, Hong Kong dollars, into uh, investing in innovation and technology, uh, and it is all useless, wasted. I don't think all those $50 billion necessarily is spent in the right way, but in fact, if you look at some of these other countries, they are spending a lot more than $50 billion. You know what the problem is for us? When we see the governments here, they say, when we do technology innovation, we try to solve a problem. Our government never communicated to us that what are the problems they need to solve, other than we need to develop innovation and technology. Why? The reason is because we need to develop innovation and technology. <laughs> so what, why? What, who will you benefit? Uh, we will benefit because if we, everybody is developing innovation and technology. So, they have, they, so that's the difference, you know. Uh, uh, so we laugh at it, but uh, the, that's the first problem. The second problem that we face in Hong Kong is that in terms of distribution of wealth and distribution of resources, People in Hong Kong don't perceive the government to be fair. You are not willing to spend $20 billion on our... Uh, universal, pension. universal pension, for example. You're not willing to spend a penny on those issues, but you are willing to spend billions and billions of dollars into uh, technology. You must be trying to help the rich people. Or you know, those Chinese enterprises. Or Chinese enterprise. So, that's, that is a populist way of thinking about it. It may not be entirely wrong, uh, true. It is not entirely true, but it is not entirely wrong. <laughs> uh, because our government is perceived to be, you know, favoring what, uh, businesses over the need of the community. And I think until and unless our government also be more equitable in its overall policy, you know, that actually makes hard, life hard for some businesses as well because the government is not having an equitable use of its resources. So I think I also want to bring that out uh, because I, I we're see, it seems like we're saying all these uh, good things, talking about all these good things about technology. But on the other hand, you know, deep down, why people in Hong Kong uh, is so skeptical, it is ultimately, again, because of our political system and the lack of fair distribution of not just wealth, but uh, political power. Okay. Thank you so much for um, you two coming all the way to Tian Sen and share your thoughts um, towards our audience. And uh, I'm, I think you guys were too tired of me asking too much questions. So right now the floor is open to the public to ask uh, any questions towards uh, two legislative members. Uh, yes. How much you know, you said that uh, traveling around companies that people don't really uh, think of Hong Kong in the very first thing in mind. Back in April at Stanford, there was a government official with the Hong Kong Trade Office on the panel with Agnes Chow. And I'm wondering if you know this guy, he's in the San Francisco office, and why is he not doing what you're saying needs to be done in um, terms of building out? I trust the gentleman you refer to is the director of our economic and trade office in San Francisco. Um, that should be our government administrative officer. Um, right. And I I haven't met him. Uh, we were too busy, so I, we had a clash of uh, diary, so we were not able to meet him here. Um, I understand a lot of Hong Kong officials, so Hong Kong uh, civil servants, they do their job. But they are not politicians after all. They are not the salesmen of Hong Kong. So it's not that we have a presence or an office here that is sufficient. Uh, we need to, as Charles said, that office is not target or tailor-made for tech. That's economic and trade, so it's very broad and general. What we should do instead is we should have someone with a tech background here to help our startups with Hong Kong background and to attract talents. 
uh, when Singapore and Taiwan specifically, uh, when the Taiwanese government, they have a delegation here on, a, on an annual basis to attract talents, not only with a Taiwanese background, but anybody here in Silicon, Silicon Valley to work in Taiwan. What are we doing? What's he doing? Well, I, I have no idea. I'm not here to defend them, nor to, sp to speak but on his behalf. That office will be reaching out? That office is not reaching out <laughs> far enough. That's all I can okay. say. Okay, okay. Let me, let me try to help. Uh, he stands up, I stand up. We, we have been sitting for too long. Uh, okay, uh, the, there is an economic and trade office in, uh, I think, on Montgomery Street Montgomery, in, yeah. in uh, San Francisco. Uh, they, I think many years ago, they even bought the whole building, so they made some money from it. Uh, I'll come <laughs> uh, Typical Hong Kong. <laughs> yeah, well, not bad. I mean, why, why pay, just pay rent? I think they, it's the right thing. But still, other than that, what did they accomplish? Uh, the problem is, number one, government organization and bureaucracy. Uh, we actually, if you go into that office, you might find at least three uh, people doing overlapping jobs or three departments doing overlapping jobs. Not a lot of people, but the problem is overlapping and uh, everybody pushes the envelope to the other guy. The economic and trade office is more on policy level. So they support the uh, head guy who is in Washington yep. to deal with all these uh, issues uh, that, okay, trade war and so on. You need to lobby the US Congress on policy issues and so on. So uh, they do a lot of that. Uh, each regional office supports the, uh, the, uh, the uh, U.S. main office in Washington and then they work with the offices in Brussels and other countries all around the world. That's economic and trade office. It's actually, you know, somewhat, you know, dealing with a lot of these WTO, you know, international government stuff and so on. Uh, the other thing is, well, when the chief executive or uh, the financial secretary come to here and they need to organize a, uh, a talk in uh, a fancy hotel in San Francisco, then uh, they, will, they will spring into action. You know, those are the kind of things that they do. Uh, are they reaching out to, in, uh, to, 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 to uh, uh, attract Hong Kong comp uh, in here companies here to go to Hong Kong? Sorry, that belongs to our colleagues sitting in the next room in Invest Hong Kong. They are the agencies that is responsible for inward investment, okay? And then, uh, if there is some Hong Kong companies that are interested in coming here to do business, sorry, Invest Hong Kong cannot help you. Please go to that room. We have the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, uh, usually a consultant only, because they don't have staff in these uh, offices. So the problem is bureaucracy and bureaucracy and bureaucracy, pushing envelopes uh, one another. You go to Singapore, you go to other, they typically would either be single agency or they would be uh, one station. They would work together much better among different departments. Uh, so uh, I give you the wrong, but the long answer with the bureaucracy that we have in just that building in, in Montgomery Street. But uh, so uh, they must be very busy. Uh, they are doing their own uh, uh, regular routine job. You know, there are also all these uh, trade delegations coming from different parts of uh, 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 Hong, Hong Kong, from, from different organizations in Hong Kong uh, to all parts of the Western US. So uh, our director will be very busy entertaining that. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Um, yes. Um, yeah, so I'm a software engineer. but that was really almost 30 years ago. Uh, and uh, the issues that we face at the time are obviously very different now. I look at those folks today, 
that are trying to, to start a new business in Hong Kong, as well as some of the Hong Kong people who ended up doing it here. Uh, they either moved over here, or of course some of them uh, were working in companies in Silicon Valley, and then they started up here. There are different kinds, different routes that they take. But I think the first question that you need to ask is, uh, first of all, where's your market? What you're, try or for, or what you're trying to do? It could be very different. You know, we did hear from some companies who were saying that because of the fact that they're in this IoT sort of area and they need to do electronics and so on, there's a natural tendency that they want to look to either Hong Kong or even Shenzhen because of the fact that they do prototyping like crazy, very efficient, and uh, they have a great infrastructure there, much cheaper. You wouldn't do it in Germany or, or here. It would be, well, you could, but it's so much more complicated. But on the other hand, if you're doing fintech, it might be very different. I mean, a lot of things, regulatory risks and so on, you just can't do it over there. Uh, and uh, whether or not Hong Kong or even Singapore or Malta or whatever would be your pick, it really depends on what you are trying to do. So putting that aside, okay, I think the top issues that people would face, entrepreneurs would face or would need to consider if they are doing it, in, if, they, if they go to Hong Kong, is number one, capital. Uh, in Hong Kong, I think uh, increasingly we are uh, trying to close the gap with seed capital. But we're continu continuously hearing that, okay, we solved that problem, then uh, maybe what about the next stage capital, series A, B, and so on? Is that a gap? Well, late stage funding is never a gap because it's relatively safer, and a lot of these companies in Hong Kong, uh, uh, fund managers are relatively uh, knowledgeable or competent in doing it late stage. But the early stage is the problem. So government has been trying to do something with the seed level and I think uh, at the moment somewhat and also because the money is smaller. So, you know, that is, uh, so, so, so the first thing is for you, what you're trying to do, uh, the capital. Uh, and also someone mentioned to us that today uh, with, because of the US-China uh, trade war, or whatever, this situation, uh, it, accepting investment from Chinese funds would may be a sensitive issue uh, for some companies as well. Uh, even though for VC monies, you may not need to disclose it, but at some point people will know, will, or will it not affect you in future? If you continue to operate in this market, that is also one issue you need to think about. So that is money. Second, people. Yeah. So where to find people? Uh, and uh, can you find the right people in Hong Kong or versus can you find the right people here? Final uh, issue is, uh, again, where your market is. So maybe he, uh, 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 Alfred has something to add. You're, you're just listening to the expert. So, uh, it's the capital talent market. So either one or all three. So if you can identify, uh, if you can give a clear answer to yourself on these three categories, then you would know what a Hong Kong suitable for you. But that's of course, it's on the very entrepreneurial uh, side. Um, but for anyone who wishes to go back, you wouldn't ignore uh, the reality in Hong Kong, whether that is the, a good place for you to live, but to have your family in. Um, that's of course, an other matter. Um, is to a lot of youngsters is rather expensive uh, in terms of living standard. So um, if you can afford it, that's one is very good. Um, if not, then of course, but not that Silicon Valley is any cheaper. No, but but I know, just what I just want to add one point uh, is that uh, many companies are not just staying in one place, right? They have uh, they they hire a few people. Many of them actually, you know, hire a small team to develop in Hong Kong or even in China or in other parts of the world. And uh, and uh, I think that model we see a lot of companies doing that. Now, uh, in, in terms of, uh, it, it's really about the difficulty of hiring the right people. Uh, cost is really not an issue in Hong Kong. A lot of people in Hong Kong, you know, uh, Hong Kong businessmen always complain that Hong Kong is expensive. I mean, come on. I mean, rent is not expensive. We were chatting with some people here. They say rent in Hong Kong is actually cheaper than they rent a place here in the Silicon Valley for a uh, few people to do development. And uh, salary is obviously cheaper in Hong Kong compared to here. Not a good news. Not a good news, actually, for us, but anyway. So I guess that the second part of the question is, like, what are the action items that you guys want to do? Like, how do you 
Oh, okay. It's, it's similar to the, what we were just saying, what we are going to do when we return, that is um, to list out all the observations uh, that we have picked up here from our counterparts, from the government side, and also from the business side. Um, as legislator, there are things that, not that we can do a lot, but we can at least voice out. We can put things together in a very clear way so that the governments, if they wish, they could make some changes. And we'll push for some reforms, of course. Uh, we have been saying that Hong Kong is not aggressive enough when it comes to attracting capitals, investors, and of course talents. Uh, these are the things that we can uh, push for. Um, these are, and, and especially these are not as complicated or you know, uh, controversial. Um, when it comes to helping the entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs like yourself, um, I would say is we wish to build up more platforms so that people can talk to each other. Um, they are things that we can do on our side. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Uh, there may be. Okay. Yeah, well, I was going to ask a question that is kind of related, which is, you know, in Silicon Valley, we talk a lot about uh, the ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. So um, many uh, delegations have visited the uh, Silicon Valley, and, uh, and the takeaway is what they, how they can reproduce the ecosystem. Here, yeah, uh, yeah. take away and then we can use it back home. Yeah. So, uh, based on your trip, uh, I'm just curious um, on the on the various uh, factors that would affect the ecosystem. What do you think the government or private sectors have done, and what we would recommend um, to be like uh, as mm -hmm. as um, um, as you said, action items. Okay, so, so let's assume that the regulatory and the legal system is uh, friendly, right, towards uh, high tech. Um, what about areas like education, um, mm -hmm. human resources? Um, what about property, uh, public rental? Yep. Um, uh, what about, um, you know, an environment, for example? You have to attract people who are, um, one of the reasons that Silicon Valley is so attractive is, you know, obviously the weather. Now we can't really produce that in Hong Kong, but at least um, we have more rain. We, we have, <laughs> at least we got blue skies. Right? Um, so, so all these factors of living conditions, um, the availability of capital, which you partially touched on, um, from both the government and the private sector. Um, so, what I'd like to uh, hear what are some of what would be your uh, I will first of all make Charles Mock the secretary for IT. Then I oh, that means you are the chief executive. <laughs> Congratulations! <laughs> I recommend Charles Mock to the governor. I I only wish that there are chances that we can really make changes, other than making recommendations. Um, it's always a top-down thing when it comes to making real changes in the government. Um, I, I must confess that we have our limitations as a legislator. Uh, we can only uh, voice out all these issues that we picked up. But, um, but I would say it's the mentality that, that matters more. Of course, if you have, there's no way that you can create another Silicon Valley, but you can create a, a better Hong Kong. You know, there's no way you can move Stanford to Hong Kong. You can never move the answer to Hong Kong. But you can at least try to encourage those who are now working very hard at Poly U or UST, uh, those who are in the tech uh, uh, factories, uh, with, with a hope of a better chance to expand and to have their the entrepreneur's uh, uh, idea make true. Um, I, I'll be talking, I, I'll be bluffing if I keep talking, because there are not a lot of things that we can really you know, fix right away, but we can push for some changes in the government side. Okay, uh, you, you, okay uh, let me answer uh, this question a little bit more first. Uh, a lot of people over the last uh, many, many decades have been saying that they want to copy Silicon Valley. 
uh, I want to build a silicon this and silicon that and so on. You've heard it, we've all heard it many times. Even Hong Kong. Even Hong Kong. Uh, it can never be copied. And there are a lot of the key ingredients in the eco ecosystem here that doesn't exist in Hong Kong. It's not just about the weather. You know, Hong Kong is actually pretty good already in terms of weather, you know, we're yeah. safe. No, well, 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 anyway, we, we don't have the kind of natural disaster and so on, that, that, that and so on. It's, it's a relatively stable place in terms of uh, uh, weather. Why are we talking about weather? But, <laughs> but you know what, actually, that was one of the big reasons why when I graduated from a Midwestern school, I decided and my wife and all these people decided that they all have to come to California, right? That was a big issue at the time. But I think today, uh, people are looking a lot more than just about weather. <laughs> but anyway, why are we talking about weather? But uh, ecosystem. Uh, in the ecosystem, we, always, we talk a lot in Hong Kong about ecosystem too. And we talk a lot about the lack of certain pieces in the ecosystem, particularly people, capital, you know, the same thing. Uh, and uh, can, can, can we do something about that ecosystem? Yes. Uh, people, I think, will follow where the opportunities and the money or the opportunities are. Uh, market is a big piece. Government adoption, public sector adoption, I think is one relatively uh, easy area that we need to change in the ecosystem. Uh, Capital is actually yes and no. Again, with the right environment, the money will come. Money is, in a sense, really the least of our issue. But the problem is, why are they? Why are there not enough uh, early stage, after seed stage, seed stage funding in Hong Kong? Is that they the, the investor needs to see more certainty and uh, higher, lesser risk and uh, better return. They haven't been convinced about that yet. Once they are convinced, the uh, the, uh, the money is easy, they are all there. So anyway, uh, we have a lot to change in the ecosystem. There are some parts in the ecosystem that we can't do about, that we can't do nothing about, uh, like defense industry. People always talk about this piece that, that sort of ignores the influence from uh, first directly defense money and secondly indirectly a lot of the government funded money that actually some of the people we met this time also reminded us uh, those money that are coming from agencies such as NIH, such as DARPA in the US. Now, they play a big role that, in fact, in a city like Hong Kong, we cannot duplicate easily. So we have to make do with something else. Singapore don't have that either, but we have to do, make do with something else. So it's not really about, I'm never convinced when people say we want to copy the whole ecosystem in Silicon Valley, it just never will work. Uh, but uh, some of these other issues that we need to tackle, I think, uh, well, Elvin also talked about those. But uh, I really don't think that we need to just simply copy. But uh, on the other hand, we need to collaborate more. You know, uh, instead of saying that uh, our greater Bay Area needs to be better and we're better and, and brighter future than the Silicon Valley over here, you know, forget about those uh, Chinese-style nationalists speaking. Uh, it's actually about that Bay Area and this Bay Area and the other Bay Areas and the other areas, the other tech centers in the world, how do we work more closely together? Okay, but Charles, um, following up on that, uh, obviously there are situations you cannot, factors you cannot reduce yeah. and there are factors beyond your control. But there are certain factors that I can think of which are possibly within reach. For example, the education system. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do, I do notice that you know, those who have the top scores in the, you know, uh, in school exams end up, you know, being lawyers and doctors and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, engineering and science are relatively low on the preferences, for example. Uh, how do we change that situation? Okay. Secondly, in terms of land uh, rental properties, is the government doing enough in terms of providing science park space? Or other kinds of financial subsidies. Uh, what are you talking about? Okay, uh, land and uh, and uh, education. Education. Uh, we have a lot of problems. Yes, our DSE is a total disaster. Okay, uh, if we uh, like, do you know what I'm talking about? DSE, right? The DSE is a total disaster uh, w w because they're telling students to study four main sub subjects: Chinese, English, mathematics, 
and uh, liberal, gen liberal, liberal study, studies. Uh, general study, liberal study, and that's it, uh, plus two other subjects. So unlike our days when we study Chinese, English, and math, and then we study physics, chemistry, uh, uh, biology, and then for the science students, okay? And uh, I could still study uh, uh, advanced mathematics, and I could still study uh, 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 geography and history. But today, four plus two, our university professor friends are saying to us that for the science students that they have to admit in the end to, uh, to their faculty, they don't know any calculus. They have to do remedial courses in the, their freshman year. So there's a huge problem, I know, in our education system. Of course, and then, and then in Hong Kong, we always like to antagonize all these different needs. And then they say, let's grab the uh, liberal study. And then, of course, there'll be a lot of opposition. And then uh, Heyman will say, no, 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 this is, not, this is wrong, right? So, but Hong Kong government loves to antagonize people, right? So, but again, uh, a lot of these problems are very fundamental. And uh, I do believe that DS, it, we have to look at, not, actually not just DSE, you have to go on uh, uh, from even more elementary uh, curriculum uh, and so on. We have a lot of problems there. Uh, so education is one area that I think we are, we're, uh, the question of why are the top students not going into technology, uh, you, we talked about because the jobs are not there, okay? Uh, that's the one big factor. But other than that, actually, the current secondary school uh, uh, and primary school curriculum and examination system is a big reason also. Uh, I don't, uh, my solution is to reform DSE, but you know how difficult that might be. Uh, but if you ask my recommendation, unfortunately, that's my big, that's my, really my recommendation. Uh, but now, uh, also land. Uh, I, we've heard a few entrepreneurs saying to us that more, 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 more science park is not what they need. Because, uh, you know, people working in science park and people working in the, in the, in the cyber port, because in Hong Kong situation, not everybody drive a car, and they don't, well actually, uh, anyway, they, 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 actually most of the companies, the good and successful technology companies that I see, many of them actually buy pass for the science park, and they go to, uh, uh, what, what, uh, Causeway Bay? Not really Causeway Bay, no, too expensive. No, no, there, there are tech companies in Causeway Bay, but wow. they're also in... I'm saying Cheng Sha Wan, yeah. and uh, Lai, Chi Kong. Lai Chi Kong, and so on. So that's why in those places, actually rent is not an issue. Much cheaper. It's okay, it's manageable. They have, they have wide open space, more similar to some of the offices over here, rather than in Science Park. But some companies do go into the science park because there are government subsidies, right? They go in there for that purpose. Is it good or is it bad? You know, the companies who survive science park and uh, can uh, graduate and so on, they all get out. But, you know, some even tell me, you know, for startups, I don't need such a fancy glass uh, window right. uh, building. Why don't Hong Kong do it the Singapore way? They remodel some old warehouses and make them into their science park. And then, of course, when they graduate, if they need a more fancy building, they move you across the street to the fancy building. But in Hong Kong, you they, anyway. So uh, it's not about land. A lot of people talking about, you know, land, uh, rental too expensive and all And if you really talk to the entrepreneurs, it's not true. Actually, they come back to us to complain that science park is more expensive than like Zigong. Yeah. So why the hell do I want to stay in? It's not really an issue, yes and no. But uh, you know, science park people come go to science park, especially as, for the startup for a different reason, for the other subsidy. Now, for the other subsidy and support program. And uh, we could go on and on about whether or not these support programs are actually spoiling some of these companies and make them actually weaker and not competitive. But that's a, a, a totally <laughs> ongoing debate too. Uh, compared to the situation here, but of course, here you don't need a government support science park like that because you have a very mature VC and ecosystem and so on here. Then you don't need that, but we don't. So we're sort of somewhere in between. 
Okay, this is the last question, Sorry. by the way. Yes. Thanks once again for your excellent panel. I've been to Stanford panel as well, and I yeah. really found that edifying learning about Chinese and Hong Kong uh, culture ahead of looking forward for innovation and IT. Uh, I'm Scott McLeod, uh, World University School, which is Creative Commons for MIT Open Course Fair Center in its five languages, including Chinese. And the one of the um, sort of main aspects of what gave rise to the IT revolution, I think, is knowledge generation um, that informs a kind of ecosystem or culture. And you, Charles, have mentioned uh, talent as being in uh, short supply, and uh, you, Alvin, have mentioned people, maybe, uh, maybe certain kinds of uh, education in terms of people as being in short supply, possibly. And one of the questions I wonder about is, how could uh, MIT online, the people in their homes um, in China and in Hong Kong, studying for free to students PhDs um, and Bachelor of Law and Medical degrees in Chinese, create a culture of science in Chinese that would further the entrepreneurial interests? So this isn't Science Park in Hong Kong. This is kind of a culture of STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And this is all echoing Benoit Castells, the Berkeley professor who wrote The Rise of Network Societies, compared by the Wall Street Journal to both Karl Marx and Max Weber in China, still a communist country, a la Karl Marx. Mm -hmm. um, the question is sort of how to create uh, maybe a uniquely Chinese science culture. The internet's distributed. Science is distributed. It's a conversation. Mm -hmm. Hong Kong and um, Silicon Valley are maybe something you're trying to cultivate as a conversation. Yes, entrepreneurially. Yes, investment-wise. But also the science aspect. Um, how do you create uh, an abundance of talent who are uh, science-oriented? Um, and uniquely uh, Chinese, perhaps, or Hong Kong. Um, what would you? Uh, what are your thoughts about that? MIT has thirty-six majors, or something like that. Most unfortunately, uh, it's not that you know easy. Uh, but Charles mentioned earlier that President Obama encouraged uh, the students to take up science by filming a YouTube video. Uh, I said maybe perhaps Carrie Lam should do something similar, but of course you would say it's not a good idea. So perhaps we should invite President Obama to do something for the Hong Kong students. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, really? Okay, why do they know who he is? <laughs> we, it's not a question for us to ask because we, it's, we have to ask the students here, why did you pick science in the first place? Why did you pick uh, engineering in the first place instead of something more money making or money more attractive or sexy subjects? These are the questions we have to ask the students. I and, think, oh, oh sorry, I thought you. Uh, no, um, we were talking, you mentioned about STEM. And last year when we were in Israel, those uh, in charge of the policy told us, in their eyes, in the Israeli government uh, eyes, of course, the students have to pick up different languages but other than what, Spanish, English, Chinese, Japanese, they also have to pick up computer science language when they were young. So they have programs for young students in the primary school level to have competitions of you know, adopting and using computer science and, and the languages so that they could have this idea, they could adopt and get used to uh, communicating with the machine in the young age. That's what the startup nation is doing. Uh, in Hong Kong STEM, uh, to be frank, I'm not a parent. I, I'm too old to, to get into the, to go back to the school system. Um, but in my eyes, STEM is just a way for the schools to get grants and funding from the government and buying new, you know, iPods, iPads, or anything, uh, new stuff for the for the school. Um, if we, we, it's too early to say, perhaps in five, ten years' time down the road, we'll see the productions of this STEM education. Perhaps 
there will be some successful stories, perhaps. But this, I, I hope uh, that will be the case. Uh, but with the use of the internet, um, if there are more students, especially the underprivileged students, actually, um, what worries me most is not that we have we have lack of students who are interested in science. It's just that they are, when they have to pick whether to pick a professional degree or a science degree, uh, the, the better off students they have is fine. It's up to them. But for the ones the underprivileged ones, the kids, they have they don't even have a choice. As I mentioned earlier, uh, when Israel is helping the young students, the kids, to pick up the language, there's a gap, the cyber or digital gap between the rich ones and the poor ones in Hong Kong. And that concerns me most. So I would say that is more fundamental uh, before we talk about students picking a uh, science major, uh, is more, is bridging the gap in this uh, digital age. I think that's uh, more important. I want, just want to add to what uh, Elvin said and uh, also picking on a couple of the points that you made. Uh, first of all, why do we need a uniquely Chinese view on the science and technology development? In fact, I think that is exactly where our problem is. I think it should be a global value. It shouldn't be a science and technology developed with a Chinese characteristics, which means uh, ignoring privacy and security, state control, and so on. And so copyrights. I think, and copyright, yeah. Uh, so I think exactly we need to MIT and others to come and forget about this uh, trying to cater to the market and uh, do something in the Chinese way. I actually think that's wrong because you are successful because you are adopting to this global value or even maybe even some of the American values and that's what made you successful. Uh, why do you, when you go into China, you don't say that, hey, actually some of the things that, you know, you shouldn't be doing this, right? You should be saying those kind of things. So first of all, I don't think we need to worry too much about uh, what is the Chinese, uniquely Chinese characteristic. Uh, and then when you talk about some of these, uh, going back to your online courses, uh, MIT, you know, obviously a pioneer in this area and so on. Uh, and uh, well, well, I think obviously more and more people we know uh, in Hong Kong are beginning to take advantage of more and more of these uh, globally available courses and so on. Even some of our universities, our own universities, are beginning to do some of those. You know, Hong Kong U, UST, uh, and so on, uh, they're beginning to uh, put out courses in introduction into a FinTech, blockchain, and so on. You know, they might be still looking at, of course, some of the more marketable, uh, market sexy areas like those. And uh, so I think the awareness of using that kind of technology to uh, to enrich your uh, your uh, knowledge and so on is beginning to catch on, but the problem a lot of times with and I'm assuming that even we're talking about these courses that are relatively low cost or even free, but the uh, but the biggest problem that we have in some cases with Hong Kong is that uh, which is a worrying trend and it has to do with some of these problems in education as well, is that there's a lesser and lesser tendency for many of the people who are working in the workforce in technology, IT, to uh, actually continue their study for new skills and new technologies. Obviously, we know that that is important because this is such changing so quickly, you know, all these technologies and so on. But uh, we see that worrying trend and we don't know why. Uh, no real quantitative or empirical study to understand why, but from some of the people we know who are doing these courses online or actually even offline, they're finding that trend. Is it because, other than cost, is it because that people are too worried? IT gaoma, they're too worried on the, in working in their jobs and they just don't have time, work-life balance, and uh, they don't have opportunity to study because their bosses require them or have put so much pressure on them. They can't leave the regular job until nine o'clock at night and you tell them to study, whether it be online or offline, you know? Uh, and so, so I don't know, you know, that's actually the, a bigger problem. 
for the adoption of these uh, continuing studies, whether they be online or offline. Uh, MIT actually is doing quite a lot uh, in Hong Kong, but not in particular that area. They are doing, they have a, they have a growing uh, innovation load, note, uh, innovation note in Hong Kong, which uh, actually I just got a message from my friend who is a very, uh, uh, who is a managing director of one of the larger uh, tech, US tech companies in Hong Kong. He just joined, uh, he's going to join MIT Innovation Node to be their CEO. So obviously they're expanding. And I said, great, you're coming, going from the commercial area into, into public or, or, or into a non-profit area. So uh, that innovation node supposedly is trying to link up these new ideas from their research and their students with students in Hong Kong uh, or entrepreneurs in Hong Kong and create you know, this node from different countries, cities working together. So MIT is actually uh, quite uh, 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 you know, beginning to invest in Hong Kong in that way. Uh, I don't know, it's, I cannot speak for them what their goal is. But of course, that's somewhat separate from some of the online courses that you're talking about. So it could be also for you to look at how to work with them being an online IT branch on the ground with resources to uh, further push your, your online courses. Okay, yeah, okay. I do see a, there's a few of hands, but unfortunately, due to time constraint, uh, we do have to end our uh, seminar. Um, so feel free to like uh, stay behind and like talk to the speakers privately. Can we, Professor Chen wants us to, can we take one more question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Part of the host, okay, yeah. We always listen to Professor Chen. The trustee of the college and the former mayor of the no, 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 it's not because it's on the front no, spe line of no special privilege, but... No, no, <laughs> on the front line of few things that are always to Hong Kong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Politicians can't be very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, but welcome to the dance college. We're very uplifted to have Alan and Charles here, you know, with Professor Chan at Stanford University, and we're one of, as Hyman and uh, Joseph can say, one of the most privileged uh, community colleges here. We want Hong Kong students to come to uh, the Anza College because we need your funds to support our, uh, our college goals too. But um, as an American born of uh, Hong Kong ancestry, you know, I'm really proud of you. First time I leave this country, go to Hong Kong in 1980. And from 1980 to 1997, when I was there for the handover, uh, as a teenager, as a school, high school, university kid, I just love the Hong Kong culture. You know, Cantonese, uh, English, uh, you know, we listen to Leslie Jern, uh, Anita Moore, Alan Tam, you know, a lot of people made me a lot. You know, and then after 1997, you know, uh, we see the decline of Hong Kong English. We see the decline of uh, Cantonese. So my two questions kind of uh, outside the role of when we get Hong Kong XR21 is that what is the role of English? And what is the role of Cantonese? I mean, can Cantonese coexist with uh, culture law? Uh, can uh, I, I just had my uh, brother-in-law, his wife, and my niece, my niece who is in primary five, and uh, she can speak very good uh, English, Cantonese, and Kotoba. And she says that twenty percent of her class is now mainlanders. And we see that when I go to my college in Kalsuing, a lot of folks cannot speak Cantonese, especially the uh, the lower workers and everything. And then I have been in Hong Kong for about three years and say that the student population and even in the central, you see Kotoba is getting more dominant. So what is the role of Cantonese? Cantonese will never die. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could, but well, anyway, just kidding. <laughs> I, of course, it's, it's concerning. Uh, we have a growing number of Putonghua uh, population in Hong Kong. Uh, some of them are new immigrants from the mainland China. Uh, most of them are less educated. Uh, they belong to the lower end of the society, unfortunately. But then have faith in the language, do have faith in, Bhutan, uh, in Cantonese. Uh, it has been there forever, and it will be there uh, in, in the next foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. um, and I could hardly imagine that the mainstream culture 
will adopt 普通話 completely in Hong Kong. So as long as, say for example, we at Latvian, we still speak Cantonese.、Uh, government officials have to speak Cantonese to speak to directly to to the majority of the population. And never forget, we have our friends in Guangzhou, in Guangdong area. Never forget. They are friends, are allies in the Guangdong province who are trying to fight very hard to protect their own R dialect.、Right. So, do not worry. There is a huge population around the world who speak Cantonese. There are a lot of them here today, and to the、uh, to the benefit of the Chinese government, there is no way they should. Eliminate the population of Cantonese people because there are lots of investors who speak Cantonese only around the world. So I have full faith in Cantonese. It's just that, of course, we suffer some challenges,、uh, you know, now and then. But don't worry, it will be there. English, yeah. English. <laughs> oh, well, it's a bit unfortunate.、Um, It's it's very challenging. A lot of businesses,、uh, special senior management, have been telling us that、um, they have strong concerns of the level of English、uh, in Hong Kong. In the old days,、uh, government officials they have to speak English, of course, for obvious reasons. They are all uh, British. Uh, nowadays, we speak less English. But、uh, again, how on earth could an international financial center? Speak no English, so、uh, English will be there. It's not up to us. Well, I I just want to be sure that these Hong Kong people are discriminating against people who are coming to Hong Kong with 155 visas that are due every day. How can we change that perception of how Cantonese speakers and Mandarin speakers can work together? The local Hong Kong people are not very happy. You can't blame them. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, you you can't blame our, our local residents.、Um, Especially those the homegrown Hong Kong people、um, is if you were living in Hong Kong and if you experienced what they have experienced over the past ten odd years, you would know、uh, is is pretty、uh, bad. But it will take a bit of time for the younger generation to understand. Instead of making enemies, it's better to make allies. Uh, to make friends with our Putonghua neighbors,、uh, I would say that should be the way forward. But again, it will take a bit of time to let them get them to understand that. I think the problem with the new immigrants goes back to some of the things I was saying about the、uh, government policy of leaning too much toward the、uh, existing vested interests and big businesses and so on, and、uh, lack of truly. Uh, spending enough resources to help the grassroots and the and the people who are really in need.、Uh, until and unless they do that,、uh, there will always be this、uh, hatred or、uh, dissatisfaction against new immigrants、uh, in Hong Kong. You know, remembering that unlike in the U.S.,、uh, where you might be talking a lot about this in the context of jobs that are being lost, in Hong Kong we are not talking about that. Well, well we have. Virtual hundred percent employment, employment. So it's not because that local people are losing jobs to Im- new immigrants. In fact, some of the new immigrants, you know, actually might might t- pick up some of the jobs that local people don't want to do.、Uh, so a- a- and we have Filipinos and other uh, countries uh, people in Hong Kong taking up the jobs that we don't want to do, like maids and other service jobs. So in fact,、uh, it's it's. It's it's a little bit different, okay. So,、uh, but the problem is back to the issue about what I said about government's policy not really taking care of the basic needs of a lot of the people who are more in the grassroots or the poorer population. That's the problem.、Uh, Cantonese, uh, 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 I, I think, Cantonese are also very resilient, and I think、uh, this generation of younger people also, you know. Uh, uh, It's really up to them to use their creativity to take Cantonese culture into the next level, and I think they will.、Uh, with this localism sort of uh, sort of uh, uh, sentiment and their and 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 emphasis for many of the young people, and I do hope that you know with the resilience of the language and culture itself,、uh, we will carry it on. 
Uh, and you should also talk to Professor Chen. During dinner that night, you told us about some of the Chinese mainland policy with the governor, you, former governor, who uh, when there were these uh, can, anti-Cantonese, uh, uh, pro-Cantonese protests in Guangzhou, right? Uh, maybe later in dinner, Dr. <laughs> Professor Chen can brief you on that. But English, finally, uh, I do think that uh, we have a big problem with the la English uh, language proficiency in Hong Kong in this generation. Uh, and it again goes back with our, to our DSE problem. I always ask this question to my friends who are secondary school teachers or principals and uh, university people. Nobody can answer, but everybody sees the problem. Why is it that compared to our days in the third exam, HACEE compared to DSE, that we spend more time per subject on uh, English, Chinese, and even math. But it turns out that our generation, uh, in terms of uh, proficiency in all these three areas, is actually perceived to be deteriorating from before. If we're worse in English, but our Chinese is better, fine. No, actually no. So what's the problem? That's a huge problem with our education system. And it starts with elementary and secondary education. I don't think we have time to get into that, but it's a big, big operation that we need. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it's a big problem. I'll, I'll, uh, but but uh, one final point. I do want to say that, you know, uh, with, the low, with the recent, uh, with these recent years, a lot of the young people uh, beginning to be very, they, they, they are very into and supportive of a localism kind of thought. But, okay, and uh, you don't want to learn or you don't want to speak Putonghua, that's one thing. But what about English? I think, you know, Hong Kong cannot be isolated. Well, whatever form of government you want, Hong Kong has to continue to be international. Even if you want to be more autom autonomous, you need to have international allies. And you cannot go to the U.S. Congress and say, do you speak Cantonese? Just like the mainlanders going everywhere they go and say, ask, can you, why are you not speaking Putonghua, right? <laughs> so we are better, if we are better than that, then we need to become more, and continue to be more international. Uh, if you guys have any further questions, feel free to stay behind and I'll, I'll talk to the two legislators individually. And once again, I would really love to, like, like to thank like, um, Elvin and Charles for uh, spending their precious time coming all the way to DNC and share your thoughts and opinion to, to the audience. And um, we have a like, uh, really special thanks to um, Northern California Hong Kong Club with uh, Mr. Chen Chen and his team. And, <laughs> and uh, also with uh, Professor Ming Chen from uh, University of Stanford uh, coming from the Department of East Asian Studies. And uh, also with like the uh, sorry, Stanford Hong Kong Student Association, Mr. To to Ching Yu. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Ming Chen would ha love to have a few words to, uh, to the audience. I would like to say that from now on, I hope our trustees management and student body could be more proactive or creative in seizing the opportunity to cross state, particularly with Mr. Alec Chow newly installed himself as a grad student in citizen at Berkeley, a very well-known Hong Kong youth activist, one of the umbrella men. <laughs> <laughs> Cantonese speaking again, and those at Berkeley 
had a bigger conspiracy. South Bay, East Bay, North Bay, and make the San Francisco Bay Area a shining example as the gateway in the old days up until the 80s when LA started to appear in Portland onto the Pacific Rim. It was always North American gateway, including Canada. It's always San Francisco to the Far East, to Hong Kong. And so we should hope what is the very successful proceeding today, and I will congratulate you people for your hard work. And yours is definitely more successful than the humble little event has done, no incident and no anything. That go ahead and do cross bay alliance. After all, we should set example for the Hong Kong Macau Guangdong alliance <laughs> they try to build. Thank you. Uh, Professor Chen, and on behalf of the Hong Kong Student Association at the Yonsei College, last and uh, special thanks to all of you who spent like your precious time coming all the way to the Yonsei. I know it's a like unique location. People are coming from all across the Bay Area and some from LA too um, to attend the seminar. And um, all thanks to all of you. So I wish you guys have a good night. Okay. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you so much.